on Facebook something very touching and dear to my heart this week. I I have a neighboring pastor in Doketown, Ron Carroll. He and his wife have just become grandparents for the first time. And I seen Sister Carol holding that newborn (laughs) picture there on Facebook. And I went, oh, man, I'm not a grandpa. (laughs) I haven't had that privilege yet. I've held some newborns. Now, if they're five days old, I probably won't take them in my arms. If it's yours, they're so delicate and small. (laughs) They get just a little bit older. Oh, yes, love to hold them in my hands, dedicate them. Or something very sacred and special, exciting and pleasing (laughs) about a newborn. Amen. How many knows that by experience? There really is. Now, just in the sense of physically, it's the same spiritually. There is something exciting and new when you see new ones born into the kingdom of God. As of late, we have been teaching some discipleship courses, and it's on purpose. You say, why? It's for the benefit of the new ones. That doesn't mean the elders have no benefit in it, and you can just stay home now. (laughs) No, that's not it at all, right? Because uh, these things are... Not new to us, but every time we go over them, we should get excited all over again because of what's happening in the spiritual life and development of a newborn. All right, and so, uh, and that's what's been happening as of late. So, elders, I trust that you won't feel like I'm ignoring you. You're very much appreciated. And take the time along with me to hold the newborns in your arms. Amen, and let's see them come to development spiritually. All right, having said that, I received a request this morning. Amen. So starting on Tuesday night, I will be doing still discipleship, but I'm going to be doing baptism again. All right, this is by request. (laughs) All right, uh, we're going to uh, do some baptism. And so I'm going to start right with the call of Abraham, the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 11. And going to bring it through to their leader, Moses, who took the children of Israel through the Red Sea. <laughs> Amen. And that's type of baptism, by the way. All right. We'll get to the Israelites down in the Egyptian bondage, but the Lord's will was that they be delivered. Okay. And so that's the tabernacle plan that they received in the uh, wilderness experience. And there's baptism in the tabernacle plan that's when we come to the labor and then we'll come right to the end of the old testament we'll look at Zechariah, the last old testament high priest and that was john the baptist father by the way and then we'll go into the new testament talk about uh, john the baptist and and get into jesus ministry and also baptism i'm getting excited about this already (laughs) amen i really am And so uh, let's do it. Praise God. This morning's lesson, the will of God. How many is interested in the will of God, especially for your life? Yeah. I uh, remember in my Bible school days, usually there's a hot topic for each year or each three-year period. And when I was in Bible college, that was the hot topic, the will of God. What is the will of God for my life? What's the will of God for my ministry? What's the will of God for the lady that I will marry? This was a concern in Bible college, okay? And Brother Sean was the principal at that time, and a great man he was. I love Brother Sean. And he had a very uh, unique way of showing some sarcasm or just a smiling and the grin on his face, and he said, uh, uh, he was talking about dating and courting here and the, quote-unquote, the will of God for your life. And he said, it's amazing in Bible school, this young man will court this young lady. Oh, it's the will of God. And he says, if you don't want anybody, I love this. He said, if you don't want anybody to argue with you, just say it's the will of God. No one can argue with the will of God. Now, he says, what's so funny about that is is God seems to change his mind a whole lot. (laughs) And the Bible tells us that he changes not. (laughs) So he said, who's the liar? (laughs) And so if you're one that's given to blame everything on the will of God when it's not his will, it's your own will, be guaranteed it will find you out. (laughs) 
all right? Let God be true and every man a liar. And that's just a little lead in this morning. How many's interested in the will of God for their life? I really am. And I look back over the past year since I've been in Bible school and see how the Lord has led me. And, you know, 20, er, hindsight is 2020. And how the Lord has directed my steps. Oh, I wish back then he had laid out the plan 35 years ahead. You know what? If he'd have done that, it would have scared me to death. And so he just takes it day to day at a time. And here I've arrived, okay, <laughs> some 35 years later. But the will of God is something very special. It's summed up in a song that I want to sing before we go into the lesson this morning. And I trust while we're singing it, it can really get a hold of us. Just if you come back to the piano. To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. Sister Irma, if you come back to the piano. <laughs> Amen. To be like Jesus, on earth I long to be like him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, I only ask to be like him. That's the will of God. Amen. I said, that's the will of God, to be like Jesus. Would you stand this morning? Close your eyes, raise a hand, and let's sing it as a prayer unto the Lord. <laughs> to be like Jesus. Jesus to be like Jesus on earth I long to be like him all through life's journey from To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus on earth, I long to be like Him all through life's journey from earth to glory. Let's sing it again. Yes, Lord. To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. On earth I long to be like him all through life's journey from earth. To glory, I only ask to be like Him. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. To be like you, Jesus. Amen. That is the will of God. Amen. Going to remain standing to read our scripture text this morning. In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, the first 12 verses, and then I want to couple with that Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that's going to be our key verse for today. But 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, 12 verses here, and let's read this morning. And furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know the commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of, well, there's that word that Mother explained the other night in Bible study, com compensins or whatever. I can't pronounce it right. Anyway, it's, it's a lustful sin, okay? Uh, 
even as the Gentiles which know not God. So he, he was telling Israel, Gentiles do these things, but it's not supposed to be named among us as children of the Lord. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. And that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. And that ye walk honestly toward them that are without and that ye have lack of nothing. Now, there's several things that have been mentioned here in those first 12 verses. Amen. In keeping with, quote, unquote, the will of God for your life. Now, let's turn to Romans chapter number 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. One more verse. Number two. And be not conformed to this world, <laughs> but be ye transformed by the renewing of mind, your minds, that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Is that what it says? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of them that I've committed to memory and to heart. Okay? Be not conformed to this world, talking about the will of God, right? Be not conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're talking about the will of God for your life today. Jesus, this morning we ask that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would be with us. Lord, as we endeavor to teach from your word, and Lord, your word is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. Lord, it does what it's supposed to do. Thank you for your word that leads us and guides us. Lord, help us today and to be obedient to the word, and we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. We sang that song, to be like Jesus on earth, I long to be like him. And if we could be like the Lord in every sense of the word, then yes, this is the will of God for our lives. We all start out by telling you during my Bible school, my dating years, and, and the will of God and how people would blame their own will on the will of God. No, that's, uh, that's being manipulative, okay? Uh, I, I thought I'd bring an example in there before I head into the rest of the message. Today. John the Baptist, he was uh, a good man of God. And I told you that Zacharias, the last Old Testament priest, and John the Baptist was his son. Well, his son was... Uh, pretty direct when it comes to the word of God. Uh, he called the scribe and the hypocrites and Pharisees some pretty uh, strong <laughs> language he used on them. And then he didn't mind right in the presence of Herod, and Herod was the king. He looked at him, pointed his finger, and said, Herod, it's not the will of God for you to have your brother Philip's wife. <laughs> that cost John the Baptist his head. It was the truth nonetheless. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> how the word is packaged makes a quite a difference, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, let's get into our lesson this morning of the will of God for your life. I want to start out by uh, telling us that we need to understand what the will of God is. And for us to understand what his will is, we need to be, first of all, in a relationship with the Lord. So I'm going to talk about a relationship there uh, a lot this morning. And then after relation, knowing what his plan is in our life for the rest of our life. Uh, I want to mention a few things of what the will of God is not. Maybe I should have started with that one. <laughs> All right, what it isn't, and then before what it is. What it's not, and then discovering the will of God for our life, how is that done? And hopefully end up well here this morning. Discipleship, teaching those who want to be like Jesus is very much an honor. 
disciple is a learner and a follower of Jesus. It's one who has dedicated themselves to know more about God's word, to know more about his church, to know more about his will for our everyday life. So discipleship is a continual obedience. I want us to get that. It's a continual obedience. In other, in other words, if you diso- discover something new, you got to obey that too. <laughs> right? So I say, if the Lord had opened up his plan to me for 35 years ahead, I'd say, oh, too much. Forget this. It comes in increments, right? And it's easy to do. It's possible to do because he is the enabling force behind what he asked you to do. It's continual obedience. So, yes, if you discover something new, you need to obey that too. Hopefully, we don't come to the point in our life where we think God's asking too much of us. Because if we do, that's when we reserve back the 100% commitment and say, Oh, Lord, you only get 90% of my life. I want to rule the other 10. Hey, but uh, say continual obedience is what is needed to do the will of God. So we purposely have made Jesus Christ the, quote, unquote, the Lord of our life. What do we mean when he's Lord? He's the boss. And we need to obey him, and we desire to know more about his will, because if we know what his will was, then we know what our will is supposed to be. What's our will supposed to be? To be like Jesus. In as much as possible, and he enables us. Okay, so for more un- the more understanding and the more comprehension of truth that we have, then we must bring our own life in line with that. We have to, and so we need to be obedient to truth. Uh, I, I want to state that again, okay, because we need to put that in our minds. When we receive new truth or the Lord shows us something in his word, we must also be obedient to do that. We have to, right, to be like Jesus. And uh, so we bring our life in line with truth. That is the will of God. If our life is in harmony with the word of God, That is God's will for our life, and it will also bring more peace and joy to us than we've ever known. Yes, it will. Uh, We sing, of course, sometimes, uh, uh, he is mine and I am his, or I am his and he is mine. (laughs) Forget the rest of the words to it. But it's like a covenant, a contract, where each other knows what's expected of one or the other. Now, if uh, the whole world could get a hold of that concept, then we would know what peace is in the world. Actually, peace is attainable if everyone desired to have the will of God for their life. It is within reach, but where's the problem? The problem is is when we stop being obedient and become disobedient, and therefore he can no longer continue to bless. Amen, but real peace is within sight. So let's get some understanding here about the will of God for our life now. If you think that God thinks like you think, you're wrong. (laughs) Let me say it again. If you think God thinks like you think, think again. Not on your life. The word of God says that his ways and his thoughts are far above ours. Well, if I'm to be like Jesus and that's how I'm going to know, how do I ever get there? Right? If he says, somehow we have to get beyond the carnal into a spiritual dimension. Lord, I want my thoughts to be your thoughts. I want your ways to become my ways. How does that happen? By becoming familiar and knowing the word of God and having a conviction about the word of God till it becomes part of our life. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. So I'm saying God don't think like you think. Right? And his thoughts aren't. I could take you back to the Old Testament. I believe it's Isaiah where he actually used the words that his thoughts are not our thoughts. Right? But they're high above. But oh, the depth and riches. They're even past finding out. That's to the carnal man. It's not saying God's impossible to find out here. Right, We can know him the more that we read his word. That's how we find him out. 
So when understanding takes place, then we must somehow attain to that level of thinking to think as he thinks and to do his ways. Our temperaments must become in line with his temperaments. Amen. And so he is on a divine, supernatural level and realm, and there's no way that the carnal can enter into that realm. That's why the Apostle Paul mentioned that he had to die daily. How was he able to do that? By the Spirit of God that was in him to put the carnal thoughts, the carnal mind, the carnal ways aside, and make a conscious decision, I'm going to live to please God. And so then he became the enabling force to live beyond the carnal realm into that which is spiritual, that which is supernatural. So there's some filters, I'm going to use that word, some filters that we need to put some of our thinking and our uh, doings through to decide if it's the will of God or not. And I'm going to show you some of these. First of all, knowing him, there's got to be a relationship. Now, we need to get a handle and a grasp on God, what his character and his personality is like, and we can't do that in one lesson. Uh, if we just read there, his ways are unsearchable and past finding out, I can't cover it in one lesson. That's impossible. But let's have a desire to have some insight into God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's how I'm going to know God, in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, what would Jesus do? What would he say? Where would he go? How would he react? What would he do? That's what's required of us. If we're going to be like Jesus and perform the will of God. First John chapter 1, not First John, just John, the Gospel of John 1, verses 1 and then dropping down to 14. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Now jump down a few verses until you get to 14. The word was made flesh. How was the word made flesh? God robed himself in flesh, came down, okay, and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now let me couple with that 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 4 and 6. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. An unbeliever, your mind is blinded. You can't know truth. All right? The God of the world blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious God of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. I'm thankful for light. I'm thankful for truth. We need to let the truth get a hold of us and, and uh, supernaturally illuminate what he means to us. Verse 4. Or in verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the world can't receive it. Those who don't believe can't receive it. But to us who are open to it, the Lord can show us some things. And you know how he shows us? Through his word, through the face of Jesus Christ. All right. So if we follow Jesus Christ through the Gospels, we're going to see some things about Jesus. You're going to see that he bends his knee to a child. You're going to see that Jesus wept with those who weep. You're going to see Jesus giving a soft answer to the poor. You're going to see him respond <laughs> quite judiciously to the critics. You're going to see him reach for the lost. You're going to see him show compassion towards those who are less fortunate. You're going to see him feed the hungry. You're going to see him heal the sick. You'll see him deliver the demoniac from his chains. You're going to see him give sight to the blind. You'll see him open deaf ears. You'll even see him raise the dead. And the list goes on and on. Oh, to be like Jesus. On earth, I long to be like him. So why? Because that's the will of God. That I be like Jesus on this earth. I am his extension, by the way. 
I'm his eyes, his hands, his feet, whatever. We are the Lord Jesus Christ to this world. Amen. So in the face of Jesus Christ, what would Jesus do? That's how I must do. What would he say? That's what I've got to say. How would he respond? That's how I'm supposed to respond. Where he goes, that's where I should be going. How he acts, that's how I should act. That's the will of God for my life. It really is. So put us up against any scenario. Ask ourselves these questions, and we can determine what the will of God is for our life. Further over in the New Testament, book of Acts, the early church, and the Lord had given a, quite an experience to the early church, and then the world began to ridicule them. Here's one of the ridicules. Did you ever hear anybody call a Pentecostal a holy roller? Not lately. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that used to be something that pokes fun. Holy roller. It's not all a bad thing. I'll tell you, if the Lord moves on me and I can't dance, I'll roll. You know, <laughs> whatever he wants. In the New Testament, here's the persecution that the church would read. Little Christ. Little Christ. They were first called Christians at Antioch. Christian, when it started out, wasn't a compliment. It was a ridicule. Little Christ. Christian. Little Christ. <laughs> hey, if you call me a Christian or little Christ today, I'll say, thank you. What a nice compliment. <laughs> Say, why? Because the will of God for my life is to be like Jesus. Amen. And so it would be an honor to be like Jesus. So I need to be in a relationship with him. When you understand God in the face of Jesus Christ, Jesus was a rational being. What do I mean a rational being? He come ag up against some pretty tense tight and stressful situations, but he didn't lose his head. Put me in that situation. <gasps> right? You get all flustered. Jesus was around, oh, Lord, if I just had enough of you aboard that nothing takes me like by surprise or, or, or throws me for a loop. I want to be like Jesus. Because that he didn't lose his head, he did, never made poor judgments. He wasn't stressed out. He wasn't on the edge. He didn't cave to peer pressure. He never retaliated to those who abused him. Now, I do see where he did get angry. It was a righteous anger. <laughs> Among the scribe hip hypocrites and Pharisees and the money changers and if you look through the scripture, probably the most violent thing he ever did was upset the tables in the house of God. Huh? Sometimes you may feel like you need to defend some spiritual thing, but you do it in a carnal way. That's not the will of God. Carnal responses is never the will of God. Help us to respond like Jesus responded. Oh, to be like Jesus. That's the will of God for my life. God is also constant. What do we mean? He's always the same. You can depend on him. His mood is temperate. He has joy. Never depressed nor confused. Always committed. Now, I wish these were qualities that I possessed. You say, why? Because if I am to be a Christian and a little Christ, and to show forth the will of God in my life through the face of Jesus Christ, then I need to be like Jesus. Oh, to be like Jesus. God is totally aware. What do we mean by that? There's no blind spots in his vision. All aspects of your life and mine are open to him with whom we have to do. He understands. He perceives. He has compassion. He's always loving, never judgmental. Oh, to be like Jesus. Mm. Oh, to be like Jesus. That's the will of God for my life. God is well adjusted. He's not insecure or inferior. He doesn't have a, a struggle with identity. He knows who he is. Therefore, he had to never blame anybody or use somebody as a scapegoat for something else. 
He never had to justify or rationalize. Say, why? Because he never had a desire to sin. (laughs) Now, sometimes, uh, I don't know if you're guilty of this or not, I might like to justify or rationalize some things that I know are wrong. You say, why? Because there's a pull of sin in my life. But oh, to be like Jesus. Oh, to be like Jesus, the sinless one. Now, God is within reach of every one of us. He's not a way off. He doesn't have a heart of stone. Rather, he tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 and 50 that he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. We see that he's very compassionate, and he does have time for us. Oh, to be like Jesus. Hebrews 4, 15. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Oh, to be like Jesus. <laughs> Amen. I said, oh, to be like Jesus. That is the will of God for our life. Our God is realistic. He does not expect the impossible of you. What he does expect, however, is possible. For without God, nothing shall be impossible. He he becomes the enabling force to do anything that he expects of you. Oh, to be like Jesus. Amen. Knowing him. Oh, yes. He's rational. He's constant. He's totally aware. He's well adjusted. He's within reach. He's competent. He's realistic. That's my God in the face of Jesus Christ. And I need to be the same. Now, being in a relationship, we also need to know his plan for our life. What have you got planned for me, Lord? Well, he does have an action plan. He wants you to be anointed. He wants to use you to do the miraculous and the supernatural. He wants to use you to be a vessel of salvation to a lost world. He says in his word he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. That's 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, are you an instrument that he can use to bring this about? That's the will of God. I said, that's the will of God. There's a plan for our life. Now, in Luke chapter 19 and 10, it tells us that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, if I'm to perform the will of God in the face of Jesus Christ, it needs to become my desire, as it was Christ, to seek and to save that which is lost. I have the gospel. I have the salvation plan. I need to communicate that to others so they also can have the same privilege that I have. That's the will of God for our life. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, notice what Jesus himself said. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to, first of all, preach the gospel to the poor. And he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. That was Jesus' ministry in this earth. It needs to become my ministry. That is the will of God. All right, to preach. Uh, Jesus came out of the wilderness after having been tempted of the devil, and he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit, and immediately he preached the kingdom. To the people. The disciples in the early church had the same privilege. They preached the kingdom also. In Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Amen. You need to be one that proclaims the word of God. Now, you might not preach behind a pulpit as pastor is this morning, 
but you are a witness to your family, to your next door neighbor, to one that asks you a reason of the hope that lies within you. So preaching may take on different forms, but it is the gospel, the good news, salvation. The will of God in the face of Jesus Christ was to preach the gospel and to heal the sick. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Wow. That's something. You know, salvation and healing were both paid for in the same sacrifice. We call it the atonement. Salvation for the soul, healing for the body. Oh, I want to be like Jesus <laughs> and his will for my life. Preach to the sinner. Preach to the captive. Heal the sick. And, of course, let me deal with delivering the captive here. In Matthew chapter 9 and 10, we're not going to read those two chapters, but there's two chapters there where Jesus went around and he was healing people, setting them free, delivering them. Wow, awesome. He was in action. So it's the will of God that we reach the lost also by preaching salvation, healing the sick, sick and bringing deliverance to the captives. This is the will of God for my life in the face of Jesus Christ. You still with me? Let's show you what the will of God is not. Okay? Our key verse in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I've heard this quoted many times as if there were three different expectations of God for us. <laughs> you know, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God's your reasonable service. You know, uh, be ye but be ye transformed by the renewal of your minds that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. There's not three wills of God. <laughs> you know, if I can't perform the perfect will of God, then I'll fall to the next category, the acceptable will of God. And if I can't be in the acceptable will of God, maybe I can be in the good will of God. That's not what he is saying here. Do you understand what I mean? what I mean by the word restatement. He's talking about the same thing using three adjectives. You know what an adjective is? It's a descriptive word. When he's talking about good, perfect, and acceptable, he's talking about the one and self same thing, the will of God. All right? <laughs> Amen. The Lord wants what's good, best, and better for you. <laughs> Amen. It's all the same thing, okay? And there's not... Try a level here, uh, wills of God. Now, whatever God expects of you or what he expects of Jesus Christ, he expects you to do it with all of your heart, all of your mind, <laughs> all of your soul, and all your strength. That includes worship and praise. He doesn't like half-hearted stuff. I'll tell you something else. What the Lord starts, he finishes. What's the will of God for my life? To what I start? Do it with the best of my ability and finish it. That's the will of God for your life. Right? Now, the will of God may not always be geographical. What do we mean by that? Now, of course, we've got to live somewhere. Somebody, a new convert especially, oh, they desire to do something for the kingdom of God, and that is the will of God. Oh, he's called me to be a missionary. Or, he, you know, he's called me to preach. I've got to leave my home. Not always that way. Now, it will be for some. I'm thankful for the missionary, Benny DeMerchin. Amen. His body landed home, I believe it was yesterday or the day before. And Benny has been a missionary in Brazil for 54 years. The Lord called him to do a work. Across the least, every Brazilian needs to hear about Jesus. Right, so somebody the Lord's going to call in this dimension, but not everybody. Well, what's the Lord calling me to do? Well, to be a witness, first of all, okay? And where do I witness? My family, my next-door neighbor, and then it begins to work out from there. Correct? Now, the will of God is not always hard to define or, or to, to find. If he has filled you with his spirit, 
then he's not hiding from you. There's going to be times when you think, Lord, where are you anyway? You know, I'm praying, you don't answer. Are you listening? <laughs> Sometimes we don't want to listen because we don't want to hear what he's going to tell us. <laughs> right? And so we feel that he's not uh, hearing us. And, and you, you knock and it seems like the walls of brass. He hasn't left you and he hasn't stopped talking. He is speaking. However, his will is unfolded to you in increments. Like I said when I started out, if the Lord had unrolled 35 years ahead of me, it would have overwhelmed me, and I said, no. But he enables us day by day. So it's not difficult to find. He is your father. He will direct your steps. And keep in mind, the Lord wants what's best for you. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. Talking about his will is not difficult to find. Ask, shall be given you. Seek, ye shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And to him that seeketh, findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom, if a son asked bread, would he give him a stone? Or if he would ask a fish, would he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good gifts and good things to them that ask him? Amen. He's your Father. He wants what's best for you. He has never left you nor forsaken you, though by times the walls will seem as brass and you can't get through. Ephesians 5, verse 17. What are you to do in the meantime? Here's a secret. What are you to do in the meantime? Therefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of God is. How do I understand what the will of God is <laughs> when it seems like the Lord's not speaking to me and the walls are, I can't do this and whatnot? What am I to do? Here's what it is to do. Understanding what the will of the Lord is, and then he tells us in the next verse, verse number 18. Oh, I bet you I didn't put that in there, did I? No, I didn't. Here's what it is. Be filled with the Spirit. Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And make melody in your heart to the Lord. That's the will of God in the meantime. Right? And so that's to understand what his will is. Regardless if I can't feel him and can't get through to him, I'm still through the Spirit that's within me, going to speak to myself in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and make melody in my heart to the Lord. People might think I'm crazy, but I'm in my right mind. <laughs> Amen. That is the will of God for your life. So number three, how do I discover the will of God for my life? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> First of all, you make yourself available. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, again our key verse, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. That's your reasonable service. you got to be available. You can't hold back in your commitment. You have to make him Lord of your life, 100% of your life, not 90. Okay? Lord, whatever your will is, I want to be obedient, and wherever your will may take me, I still want to be obedient. The Apostle Paul came up on against this but at times, and he said, Lord, through your spirit to me, I have to mortify the deeds of this body and crucify this flesh on a daily basis. Why? Because I don't want to live on a carnal plane. I want to live on a spiritual plane and do your will. Amen. So why? Because we cannot serve two masters. And the Lord will not force himself upon anybody. If he's going to occupy the throne of your life, then he must do so by invitation. So let's talk about the will of God in two aspects. First of all, general and then specific. The general will of God. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 through 12 again. That was our text we started out with, wasn't it? General will of God. Uh, 
because of time, uh, we won't read that again, but just let me sum it up for you there. Okay, uh, the will of God, even our sanctification, uh, separate ourselves from the world, uncleanness, uh, fornications, adulteries, all that, that's of the world. He said God didn't call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Then he told us to love one another. He told us to study to be quiet. He told us to do our own business. He said to work with our own hands and to walk honestly. That's all part of the general will of God for our life. Be a decent citizen, in other words. <laughs> all right? And don't be a devil on wheels. <laughs> Correct? And the Lord just wants us to be good people. So the will of God, notice the word there, sanctification. Some may not understand what that is, so l let me tell you. Sanctification means a separation from the world and a separation to God. That's sanctification. In other words, that's your part. That's not God's. You make a conscious decision, I'm not going to live like this world. I'm going to give myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's sanctification, separation from the things of this world. It involves the redemptive work of Jesus in your life. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. To whom, the God, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Little Christ, Christian, to be like Jesus. <laughs> Amen. That is the will of God for our lives. And then as we uh, perform the general will of God and speak to ourselves, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in our heart to the Lord, even in difficult times, then he'll move us onward to the specific will of God for our lives. What's the specific will for, his, for our lives? That's when he imparts to us his gifts, his callings, his attributes. Now there's the problem right there. We want to know the specifics up front. Doesn't work that way. And because we want to know all the specifics up front, we experience much anxiety. We become impatient. But our Heavenly Father, who knows what's best for us and knows that we can only take it in increments, knows we're not prepared for all that yet. Hello? But as things begin to unfold, then yes, he will give his anointing to us. As things begin to unfold, yes, we will understand more of his word. As we get to know him better, yes, we'll have compassion like he has. As we know him more, we will understand his commands and his direction and his answers in a better way than we have known. Oh, it's a privilege to move beyond the general will of God to get into the specific will of God. Amen. Now, uh, again, we can ask ourselves some questions here. I call it the sense test. <laughs> We're trying to find out the will of God on a carnal level. Well, if it's a car any carnal part, of let me give it to you this way in four ways. If the Lord asks you to do something, first, does it make sense? And number two, does it make Bible sense? Number three, does it make spiritual sense? And number four, are the circumstances right? Just a little filter there to discern or to know the direction, okay? The Lord our Father doesn't reveal his specific plan all at once. Usually his plan is time sensitive. What do we mean by time sensitive? Not everything happens overnight. As a matter of fact, the will of God for you is a lifelong process. Timing. interject something here that was not in my in my notes I remember when we were having meetings down here in the United Church Hall prior to building it I was in the middle of a service and all of a sudden whew, deja vu I say what was it here I am in the perfect will of God I say what was it back a number of years ago I wanted to into the work of the Lord 
home missions work and build my own church. Well, that was 20 years in the making. But all of a sudden, here it is. Amen. That's why I'm saying time element sometimes. You're not ready. You need to learn some more. Maybe you don't have the full understanding. Maybe there's more perfecting to do in your life. The Lord always has an answer. And here's his answers. Yes, no, wait. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) Yes. Or no, or wait. Now, let me go to that second one. No. His no's are not eternal no's. It just may mean you're not ready yet. It can turn into a yes with some more perfecting, with some more obedience, with whatever, okay? And so, not time. So the Lord moves us along. So he always has an answer, yes, no, or wait. Let me conclude here this morning. We need to have patience in the delay, knowing that he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be, okay? The will of God is, first of all, a relationship, him first, no other gods before. Second, in separation from this world, our sanctification, that's the development stage. Third, when he imparts his gifts and his talents to us. And fourth, when we finally go to work in his kingdom. Be very passionate about the steps and let him be Lord of your life. Amen. Preparation often takes time, but it needs the time of preparation so that you won't be shaken in times of crisis. This is the will of God. Now, in closing this morning, someone may say, well, I believe the Lord is calling me to be a preacher, a missionary. That's fine. And again, that may take some time. But be a witness right now. Right? So then the doors begin to unfold. You know, there might be a day when someone might be desire to be a pastor, maybe even take Pastor Trail's place. The pastor in Ashwalk Valley Pentecostal Church. I want you to remember something first. It took Pastor 58 years to get here. Let me take that a little bit further. He's still working on me <laughs> to make me what I ought to be. All right? The will of God is a process, a lifelong process, and he moves you along. Lord, never let me get to the point where I'm disobedient in that process or I can undo everything that's been done up to this point. Three more scriptures. Proverbs chapter 3. Verses 6 and 7. I may not have put 7 in there, but. Proverbs 3. Is it 6 and 7? In all thy ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That's the will of God for your life. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Psalm 40 and verse 8. Here's how the psalmist David reacted to that. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. In Psalm 37. Verse 25. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. This is the will of God for your life and for my life in the face of Jesus Christ. Oh, to be like Jesus. That's the will of God for my life. Would you stand this morning? Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. 
Amen. I feel his presence this morning. Do you feel? <laughs> Amen. Do you feel his presence? Mm. Amen. Lord, I want to be obedient. Lord, lead me today. Guide me today so that I can face tomorrow. Amen. I want your will for my life. Amen. We're going to sing a song. Altars open this morning. We pray that you'll all come and let the word take effect before you go the other way. Okay? Let's come this morning. <laughs>